Hey guys, welcome to this BAFTA Games live stream hey. from the multi BAFTA award winning studio Creative Assembly. Uh, my name is Danny Sweeney. I'm a senior character artist on the Total War Warhammer team, and I specialize mostly in characters and creatures, mostly humanoid characters and uh, people who generally wear armor for the most part. Mm. Uh, and would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Jazz. I'm a lead character artist on Warhammer. And as well as Danny, I... Jazz most... is my boss. Yeah, I, I'm his boss. I tell him what to do. I shout at him. Um, she shouted at me for 15 minutes today. I did. I was very, very in power. <laughs> I also prefer to mostly focus on creatures. Um, it's just my, my preference, I think, mm. in character designing. So... Yeah. That's what I enjoy the most. Yeah. Uh, and so, essentially, we're going to spend the next hour, or, you know, closer to 50 minutes, I think, leave 10 minutes for questions yeah. at the end, uh, talking about the processes we use for sculpting, texturing, and just general artistic techniques that we utilize when creating characters and creatures for the Warhammer series. Uh, and so we've joined up with BAFTA Games for this live stream uh, as, part of, as part of their, uh, their BAFTA Crew Games program, mm. which is a fantastic network for those currently working in the game industry or who are you know they've been working in the industry for a few years I think, yeah yeah generally join uh so yeah we're going to just essentially just kick off now and get into the discussion the discussion i should say <laughs> the uh the workshop so this is these these are the dark elf female dreadlords uh these are probably my favorite unit that i've made for uh, uh warhammer so far actually i think they're my favorite unit of yeah <laughs> I, I i also just like the color purple so it is my aesthetic also uh my inner emo kind of screams for these guys <laughs> They're just pointy edge lords, and I'm for it. So yeah, uh, I just want to briefly touch upon, to begin with, the challenge, the inherent challenge of uh, translating concept art into 3D because it's difficult. Uh, it's not just a by and large case of copying a concept and translating it. It's about understanding artistic intent mm. uh, and essentially utilizing artistic rules during the creative process in order to better translate a concept into our 3d objects yeah uh we are just you know uh, a character artist as a designer as much as they are a um a tech you know there's a some people like to call character artists almost technicians because there's a very technical yeah. aspect to it we are artists but we're designers we have to design. yes exactly uh so just briefly uh so these are the girls here um i think the you know generally speaking because i utilize quite a lot of artistic principles while developing them uh, they came out really well. So let's quickly talk about understanding concepts and this is a point I want to make for concept artists out there as well. Uh, this is a quick illustration by my lead badge. Uh, there, there, should, no, there are two leads on the uh, oh, the yeah. Warhammer team. Uh, sometimes they fight. No yeah. they don't, they're great. Uh, so badge essentially with this image, his intent was showing how important it it is to understand the physicality of how a character moves in game or should be able to move in game uh, and how essentially when you're designing a character especially one who's wearing heavy armor mm -hmm. how that can impede uh, how they function so imagine if essentially if you kind of read it imagine if that was solid metal okay yeah like how is that character supposed to move his shoulder if that gauntlet is made entirely out of plate mail, how is he actually supposed to function? How is he supposed to move his hand? He can, he his can't. fingers as well. He's, yeah, he can't even go on his phone. He can't check Twitter. <laughs> so yeah, important point. Understand the physicality of what you're trying to make. Uh, so yeah, uh, look at cosplay. People mm. who you know, people who create armor for a living uh, and it's built around being light and mobile. So you can kind of move about and do cool anime poses at mm. conventions. Uh, go into... <laughs> going to museums and essentially just you know research always research when you're creating a concept and research just as much when you're using a concept to translate into 3d okay yeah uh if i didn't understand how this works in real life like how van braces fit on how a front plate uh sorry how a breastplate and a back plate strap on to the body uh how, how a helmet sits on top of the crown of a head then none of this would work right None of it would work yeah, at all. It needs to be believable. Yeah, like. it has to be completely believable. And it's important to kind of realize that as you're working, yeah. as much as it is to understand artistic rules, okay? So when I say artistic rules, I don't mean like, well, generally speaking, I'm talking about principles that are important in portraiture or in fine art, such as uh, flow, gesture, yeah. rhythm, 
uh, the rule of thirds. And uh, I mean, the one I want to touch on the most are forms. Really important. Yeah, forms. Really... I mean, you kind of talk about forms in a little bit as well. Oh, yeah, I will. Uh, so just to begin, flow is something that I've really tried to kind of echo through my work recently. And when I say recently, I mean like the past two years. Oh, God, I'm getting old very quickly. <laughs> so. Bye. I know, right? So something that's really important is understanding artistic intent in a concept, okay? So the intent of this concept is that all these cool edges flow into the into the face. Yeah, so, I see this. Yeah, so you have all these colours and all this all these secondary forms, and we'll touch on that in a little while. All these secondary forms are leaning into the head. So that then becomes a focal point for the player. And that means that essentially it's successful in leading the eye toward the head. Same with this one. You have these large shapes and these snake-like... Uh, well, they're not snake-like, they are snakes. <laughs> they are snakes. They, well, they're not they're metal snakes. Leading into the head. Same with this one. You have all these, like, interesting zigzag yeah. forms leading your eye. Like, these forms swoop in and they lead you towards this area. And that's a very... It's a very traditional art thing as well. Like, every piece mm -hmm. you see, there's always a focal point. Yeah. So it'll be the same. So think about your focal point, realize where it is, and essentially use artistic rules in order to successfully convey to the viewer. Uh, when I say viewer, I mean like in, a, in, a, in, an art, in an artistic sense. This would be the player. Mm. Uh, convey to the player where, they, where, where, where you want them, them to look. As an yeah. artist, you have control over uh, how people view your art, and so using artistic rules can help you achieve that. So flow is one, okay? Making an interesting flow and making interesting elements sort of act in unison and in harmony and so let's really quickly look at uh, the female dreadlords cool. in 3d so this was uh, i build all my stuff in max whenever i'm working with armor i'll, I'll build it in max i'll briefly touch upon how i've uh, built this as mm. well but what i want to just really quickly look at is just how well all these shapes flow together from all angles so when you're creating 3d art again as i'm sure many of you are aware it is in 3d right so you have to be able to spin around and look at it from lots of different angles in order to actually make sure that things look mm. and function well okay if something only works from the front view or the side view or a three quarter then it's kind of a failing uh, you need to be able to actually construct your art in a way that it works from most angles it's all about that silly work it's all about that silhouette. So, as you can see here, this all these forms work really well together. They're creating this like almost bullet esque shape, and it's it's it's, it's jagged. It's it's a uh, it's quite dynamic mm. and it's very aggressive. And that's um, dark elf aesthetic. It's working towards the dark elf uh, design language, which is why it's quite successful. Mm. So, and it works from a lot of different angles. Mm -hmm. So, essentially, as a as a quick example, say for example, if I was creating this and I wasn't thinking about the intent. It's a little test I made earlier. <laughs> that is uh, the best art I've ever made. So say, for example, just real quick. Okay? That's going to be really quick. Mm. And if I was hadn't been thinking about how that crest was built interestingly, you can fall oh. into quite a quick trap with how we... Uh, oops, my Maxis seems to be playing up a little bit. Let's try that again. You can fall into traps, okay? Because what what happens is you can kind of become complacent in your design, and generally speaking, that means mm. things will look bad. So if if I'm not thinking about how good this crest will look from all angles, then you can quite easily destroy the piece of art. Okay, so let's just really quickly. Bah, 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 bah. I think we've got a question which I'll look at real quick. Mm. Let's look at the concept real quick. That's not the concept. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So that I could very well read that as being a read this the second crest here as being flat. Okay. But that being flat would ruin this flow. Yeah. And so in order to actually sort of circumvent that, we need to realize when we're developing art that it's in 3D space. Okay. So this looks like a gun dam right now. <laughs> um, but you can see cool shades yeah but you can see that that is way less interesting yeah. right from a profile view you've just got this flat shape and it, just, it looks pretty bad okay so let's take the uh that's off where is the oh so, yeah. yeah i think that's why it's important as well for concept artists is to understand um how things do work from all angles mm. so it's important to show 
like a profile, a side view, possibly a th maybe three quarters view. Um, the more views there are, the the more we we can see how it will look in three D space. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the most challenging character design in Modern Warhammer. The most ch challenge. So really quickly, mm -hmm. uh, the most challenging one was the Necrofex. Absolutely. Uh, for uh, for Vampire Coast, that was uh, that was insane. Uh, you can check check out the Necrofex Colossus. It's a big uh, necromantic. Big, big, big. It's a big <laughs> burly, crazy, crazy thing. Big burly boy. <clears throat> um. So let's just move back to the uh, pure ref real quick. So secondary, I want to talk about forms. And so Jan said earlier, silhouette is everything, and it's so true, right? Like silhouette is the most important aspect of developing a character. Mm -hmm. So the silhouette for the female dreadlords is very much one of a feminine form, uh, but covered and armed to the teeth with armor and Pointy weapons. Pointy armor. And so the way we accentuated the female form was by creating this nice curve here with these plates. Mm -hmm. So you're accentuating the hips. Uh, but she's not like wearing boot plate or anything, which I think is like I I really wanted her to have like just a, a normal functioning breastplate, mm. uh, and so I'm really happy we we could actually make her look female for, even f from a distance, and that's the important thing for Total War. You tend to be viewing your units from a large distance, okay? Mm. You're really drawn back, uh, so you need to be able to make them really unique in their silhouette f from each other. Yeah, which uh, means bigger shapes, bigger forms, but chunky, chunky. <laughs> but elegant. <Thick. laughs> uh, but uh, it, it, it is important that they look like they're from the same faction. So yeah. a dark elf needs to look like another dark elf. There has to be a, a sense of visual unison. Otherwise, uh, the design language of the faction tends to fall apart. Yeah. And so it forms, okay? So the red is the silhouette. That's your first read or your primary form. The blue fo uh, forms are your secondary forms. And those are forms that are generally... They break up the primary forms, okay? They can still inform the silhouette, but what they're doing is they're they're the ones you're kind of using to lead the eye around your piece and create little visual points, like little anchor points to draw the eye towards a, a certain focal point. And you can have more than one focal point on a piece of art, but what you want to do is utilize your secondary forms in order to kind of lead the eye mm. to the destination. The yellow... The yellow parts are tertiary forms. Yes. And those are your third read. Third reads? I'm not sure how many fingers I put up there. <laughs> those, those are your third reads, okay? And what they're going to do is create noise, or generally speaking, they'll create high volumes of information for the viewer to kind of read, or, you know, essentially take uh, information away from. So it can, it can infer. Uh, like skin uh, pores, pores, lesions, or chain mail here, or these small little parts here, which aren't part of the silhouette. It's the bit that I feel when you're starting out, um, like first developing like armor or characters or anything, it's the bit that people tend to jump into the mm. quickest. Yes, exactly. So yeah, so you'll often see an art station with a uh, people who are generally starting out in ZBrush, they'll kind of just make a face or a body and they, they won't actually apply any knowledge to their sculpting. And what they'll do is they'll just add skin pores or they'll add wrinkles without actually nailing your primary and secondary forms first. And it's so, so important mm. to take a step back and really nail those forms first before you actually start to develop your art further. Yeah. And so one thing I want to look at is this real quick, and I hope we can try and convey this to you. So on the right, I've created, this is the best art I've ever made. This is a box. I call him Greg. <laughs> this is Greg the box. And so what Greg's doing here is he's uh, essentially trying to convey the point I'm making about forms. So the red box is your, your primary form, right? The blues are your secondary and the yellows are your treasury. And you can see here I've made kind of, you know, your eyes drawn to these areas because I'm utilizing this rule. Your eyes drawn to the areas of noise because I'm le I'm kind of leading your eye around here. Whether you like, yeah. kind of understand the concepts. If you look at the one on the left, it's just abhorrent. It's just, just it's, it's too much, right? It doesn't make any sense. There's it's very rigid. It's, it, it also, it's constructed. It looks man-made mm -hmm. because we're utilizing a lot of right angles and uh, it's very orderly. Mm -hmm. um, things that occur naturally in uh, the real world tend to not have a lot of right angles in order. It's all about utilizing noise properly and yeah. utilizing this rule properly in order to actually infer an interesting focal point on your artwork. Yeah. And that comes with a, either natural stuff or hard surface stuff like this. So let's really quickly just look at the uh, f 
armor in here. And yeah. one thing I wanted to just touch upon real quick is real look quick. real quick. Look how low poly this is. Just it's super uh, duper low. How, how low poly is that? Something I see quite a lot of when uh, I'm developing, uh, or rather when I'm talking to people about developing art, yeah. is how high poly they make their. Uh, their armor it's not um, necessary yeah it's not oh. necessary obviously like when you're taking th things into zbrush or when you're uh working with high poly meshes you need to actually have density there to order to create good normal maps yeah. always research how to create normal maps properly that's a very technical thing which we won't get into now because yeah. i've done workshops on that in the past but if you uh want to ask me about normal maps at any point please get in touch uh so essentially you want to be able to control the mesh, okay? So if you're creating a, a hard surface elements for a game, or you know, for even for movies or whatever mm. you're doing, you're using as little poly as you can to create a end result. And what you're going to do is you want to essentially going to want to, to smooth it eventually. And what we'll do by that is a uh, either adding a. a Depending on what package you're using, mm. it's going to be a different result. But if you're using Max, you want to turbo smooth it and then push, add a push modifier at the ends in order to exaggerate those edges, those edges and create interesting looking reflections. So you'll see here, there's little nicks here. Mm. And that's, you know, that's fine. Like, I mean, you can, depending on what you're doing, if you're creating a first pa a first person gun you, uh, for an FPS, a first person gun for an <laughs> FPS, a gun for an FPS, you may want to spend more time uh, mm. actually uh, making sure that the topology is perfect or the uh, the to, the quad quadology flow is a uh, smoother. Yeah. But generally speaking, for something that's going to be viewed from this distance, it's fine. Uh, it's al also, if you're taking it as ever, you kind of clean things up. Yeah. But this is kind of my, my, my workflow for creating armor, is I'll create a very low poly, very, very clean, and then just turbo smooth it in max. So you can see here, the same with that, right? Mm. And then, uh, we should probably jump into talking about detailing and how I tell, um, deal with storytelling. Uh, so this is basically what I had in max, right? But it's in ZBrush now. Well, <laughs> as you can see, it's in ZBrush now. ZBrush? This is ZBrush. What? Say hi, ZBrush. Hello. Was that ZBrush or was that you? That was me. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, so let's look at this okay so generally speaking for warhammer and this is going to differ depending on what your project is and how you are you know just what your general workflow is but generally speaking we don't add a lot of tertiary noise to mm. our sculpts what we'll do is we'll use substance uh, painter or we'll use quixel, quixel uh, to create noise and by noise i mean like skin pores or like really like if you have like really dinged up armor yeah uh like something i used to do like for creating noise is like something like actually let's not do that let's add that change your brush something i used to do and something you can do when you're detailing is uh just essentially use what's in zbrush like just just use what's in zbrush i i, I use what's in zbrush all the time for, uh, whenever i'm uh, detailing stuff mm -hmm. i can get away I could, I could detail an entire character so a lot of people ask like what brushes do you mm. use alphas. uh what, what alphas you use and that's a fine question a lot of people sort of um look or i shouldn't say look down but rather a lot of people uh, feel there's more yeah yeah <laughs> ZBrush is already ha yeah already has so much in there that it's, it's quite powerful. Just it's using very, it's the, very, very the powerful. standard alphas, the standard brushes. Yeah, it's just it's just learning about how to play with them really, yeah. and so how to tweak. Exactly. So what I've done right now is I've just put like let's change the mat cap so you can kind of see. Damn. Mm. So I've uh, just put um the, this alpha, the uh, gradient one, on a spray on a low intensity, and I'm just like going about like doing this kind of thing. And if you, so for the chaos warriors, we did this this kind of stuff in the sculpt. Yeah. We don't generally do it anymore. And what we're doing is we're just adding noise, right, and inferring detail onto our sculpt, and this kind of gives the, the impression of like rough yeah. ca um, cast iron. And it's subtle as well. Yeah, it's subtle. Now with with noise, okay, what you want to do is try and tell a story, okay. So you're going to want to add like dings and like larger wear and tear to sculpts, generally speaking. So mm. like using damn standard, you can have like large arrow hits. And you know, just like really get in there and just make it nasty. Yeah. You may want to make a like a morph target as well, just so you can get a little more control. So if you don't like something, you can change it back. Generally speaking, though, like as I was saying, storytelling is important. Yeah. The dark elves are very proud creatures. They don't tend to wear armor that is very damaged. Like they're clean they're, they're like they're clean and they're nasty because the, uh, the, the the dark elves basically um like 
subjugate other uh, other factions mm. and force them to do their uh, their dirty work. Mm. And so they would have like people like looking after all their armor and stuff. So yeah, they wouldn't have much in the way scratches or you know not compared to like beast men or anything. Yeah, like, exactly. Nasty. Beast men, beast men basically like find pots and pans <laughs> and wear that wear them. So generally speaking, yeah, just like you can just use the airbrush and just use use a um, use what's here. Mm. Use different things uh, and try and tell a story when you're detailing. So, like where he's been hit on yeah, his armor, exactly. where like where would you generally be hit? Where, 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 yeah, where, you want to attack the head? You want yeah. to like. Where would they be hit? How would they be hit? Um, think about the strike of the blow, like when you know they've been hit with a sword. How would the blade travel along this edge? Mm. Like it would hit this edge cause a cavity and then trail down and maybe ding here mm. um some sometimes you get people just do this kind of thing mm. and like you know it's, that's not anything really you need to try and sort of think about the physicality of what's happened to them tell a story i think i've said that 20 times now <laughs> but it's really really but important really... and it makes it more fun when you're sculpting is yeah exactly your character artists you know you're not just gonna make a standard character you want to think about the story you want to think about what's what that, makes the what's character. that mean? Like environmental storytelling like the, the, the meme oh i don't know yeah, the, well, yeah it's, 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 it's just storytelling right <laughs> so yeah. let's uh let's move let's move out of this and what, what i'm going to talk about real quick uh in terms of storytelling mm. is cloth so cloth is something that people talk about quite a lot. We love cloth. Is, cloth, cloth is something people talk about quite a lot it's important in the world. In Warhammer. That's important, uh, just generally speaking, in the world. <laughs> cloth is important. Imagine a world without cloth. Hmm. So generally speaking, um, again, detailing is telling a story, okay? So for the Tomb Kings, and I want to just bring up Arkin, the man with many names, mm. real quick. If I can find the right PRF, there we go. Arkin. Uh, is one of the faction leaders for the Tomb Kings, okay? Uh, and he, generally speaking, is where he, he, he's undead. He's been buried for thousands of years. So he's wearing this tattered cape, and it's again telling a story. It's t it tells us something about his character. He's, you know, he's decrepit. He's a skeleton. He has no need for a cape, but yet he's wearing one because it's it's showing fancy. It's it's it's, it's showing his status. It's, uh, but it's also showing the fact that he's uh, an arbiter of death and decay. Look at this. It's, it tells us something about the character. So this is what you need to think about when you're mm -hmm. detailing your characters. Uh, even if it's not in the concept, it's something you should generally think about. It's good to kind of, you know, think about the character when you're sculpting them. They don't exist in a vacuum. And so, yeah, when I'm sculpting cloth, exactly the same thing, okay? So generally speaking, all I'm doing is I'm trying to tell a story. But what story am I trying to tell? Apparently a never-ending one. <laughs> uh, so let's just change these alphas real quick i'll start out by just polishing so this is this was simmed in um uh marvel's um, designer I, yeah i was gonna say substance no marvel's oh god imagine if, it, imagine if you could so no. generally speaking use layers use morph targets i'm going to just put a quick morph target on this mm. um i'm not going to spend too long on this because i do want to pass it over to jazz that's okay, ah, that's okay. <laughs> uh and generally speaking what we're going to do is add memory folds just That's really all. really really just get in there get nasty mm -hmm. and what we're doing is we're adding and this is just a standard brush yeah like standard just... brush i mean again you can use alphas if you want you can use uh, different brushes but the, my, my point today is i wanted to just try and show you you don't need to you can mm. just use whatever you want in zbrush in order to do this and so we're adding this is where the cape has been like bundled up for thousands of years on arkin right it's been lying in yeah no. it's been decrepit it's been just you know misused his cat has been like <laughs> sleeping in it for thousands of years just mm -mm. tearing it away yeah and so generally speaking yeah just really get in there and just have fun with it so memory folds run perpendicular to the grain of the cloth so the grain's running this way the memory folds are running this way because the grain has been crushed by the weight or gravity 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 or areas of tension and fair memory folds for the most part and so i want to make this look really 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 just almost like destroyed so i'm going mm. to take an inflate brush and just go out along the edges and just get nasty change this to spray real quick real quick cool, cool. <laughs> thanks pal um and um just inflate those edges right yeah bring them out and just, just really get into them yeah 
And get this it would there. be this would be outfit out, right? Like... Yeah. So in the low poly, this would just be one sheet, right? That that would be one big quad. But you can see from a distance, these edges are popping, and it's reading more as frayed cloth. Mm. That's important for far away as well. It's important because they're far away, and yeah. So just get in there, get it damn standard. Just start adding little nooks and crannies. Uh, get in there, add little holes. And generally speaking, again, don't need you don't need like any fancy brushes. Mm. Well, there's one fancy brush I'm going to show you, which you do kind of need. Hmm. And you'll see that in a second. Yeah, drag wreck. So yeah, one thing uh, is that Arkin is obviously wearing a cloak that's been blasted with sand, which is a uh, you know sand can be a powerful corrosive uh, mm. when you know. Uh, when it flies at you from ten thousand miles an hour, uh, so it's 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 really destroyed. Like the bottom of the cloak is like destroyed because of all the sand that's been. Because uh, this tomb kings live in the desert, if you hadn't guessed. <laughs> hmm. They, or or they live on the beach. I'm not sure which one that is. But you can see right now it's starting to sort of you know get this idea across that. Yeah. They kind of uh, you know are working in with uh, really destroyed. Where is this brush? And so we're going to use insert curve if i can find the brush curve tube there we go so this is uh an example of how you create like threads or, like... yeah exactly so what we want to do is create striations in the cloth that's a, that's a thick boy <laughs> don't have it that thick though like do, do like this and what we're going to do is just like you want to create strands right mm. and again uh rule of thirds and areas of areas of noise don't when you're creating details like this, don't make them evenly spaced like this because it looks bad, because it looks repetitive and constructed. What you want to do, natural. yeah, what you want to do is bundle them like this, okay, mm. like stuff like that. Look at that. Nice. This is an art attack. <laughs> okay, and what, generally, and yeah, you, you can do it for these holes as well, right? Like do do stuff like this, mm, like that's cool. Make them look all ripped. And you, you you obviously want to do like spend a lot more time on it than I have. I spent like five minutes on this, right? But the end result is going to be something like this. When you spend enough time with it, essentially the idea for this cloak, right? Call is, memory falls. Yeah. So the near the shoulder blades, near the scapula, uh, you can kind of see his back muscles here. Mm. Um, it's 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 hanging from his back and slowly becoming more and more crushed, right? Yeah. It's, it's becoming more like memory folds are more crushed but then at the bottom it's, it's just totally destroyed because of all the sand mm. all the sand is just tearing away at that cloth right and then we're adding little holes here um just by masking and then just like moving in simple simple like just... just like that and then just like you know taking the inflate brush so you don't need like special mm -hmm. alphas or anything you can just kind of do it see um and then adding these uh these striations using the, the curved tubes brush it really just makes it reads uh really really well mm. uh yeah i think we've got a few questions real quick before we move on to your yeah. stuff yeah, of course. uh what's your favorite model you've worked on uh oh god i really enjoyed making it so i, I made a um it was a bit of an honor actually i made uh, alistair the white line for um a, a a player who um was granted a wish via make a wish foundation mm. and that was really that that was really nice it was it was it was a great it was a great thing to work on yeah uh since total war games have a large number of units on a single place do you have to compromise a lot of poly count in comparison with other games yes short answer yes uh <laughs> we have to be very very efficient with our shaders set up and our poly counts all the time uh what we'll do is we'll move on to your stuff and then we'll work through these questions. So we'll oh. leave 10 minutes for questions at the end. Yeah, yeah. We yeah? have enough time. Yeah. That sounds good. So what I'll just do is I'll move these over to you. Oh, pass it over to me. Bear with us a second. We're moving things <laughs> around. So Jazz is going to talk about... Lizards. Lizards. I love lizards. Jazz likes lizards. And dinos. I, I like turtles. You like turtles? Yeah. Is that stable? Three, two, is, that, is that strong and stable? Let's find out. There we go. Hey. Cool. cool. So, yeah, as we... Oh, this is yours. As I yeah, said before, yeah, I'm more creature-focused, and I 
I think since I when I started on in Creative Assembly, I was given like some human tasks, some mm. armor tasks, and just found myself really, really liking creatures and really liking uh, reptiles and like really um, like seeing what I could come up with when creating scales mm. because we have lizard men, which is a lot of lizards. They are lizards. <laughs> so yeah, big 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 big, lizard boys. Yeah, so we need to come up with a good workflow in time. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's been challenging, but really, really fun. So I'll be showing you like my workflow for the cold ones. These are yeah, yeah the dark elves. So the dark elves, yeah. Um, and they're essentially just like velociraptors or baby T-Rexes, uh, just mean, chunky little little dinos. And they were so much fun to work on. <laughs> I think for that question, these guys were my favorite to work on. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. For the Absolutely. favorite model. Um, so what I'll be showing you is um, my pure ref board. First thing first is gather as much reference as you can. Mm. Like it's the most important thing when it comes to creating creature designs. Not even creature um, designs, just any, anything, anything. Of course, like reference is key. A lot of artists. I talk to a lot of artists at uh, industry events and students at industry events who show me illustrations they make mm. uh, and quite quite oftenly uh, they'll say like i didn't use reference for this and then i'll reply i can tell to, because yeah. i can see that like, i can see all the inherent mistakes there's nothing wrong with using reference yeah mm. good art is steel it's so true mm -hmm. like honestly reference is so important you need it so for these guys i looked at human anatomy which is quite strange for a dinosaur but you'll you'll see that human anatomy and general creature anatomy is actually very, very similar. Or what you can do is find a dinosaur and scan it. <laughs> if you can, like I failed at doing that. So we I couldn't just, find any. No, unfortunately. So like, you know, this forearm, this whole arm is the same as a leg on a dog, almost the same as a leg. Yeah. Um, it all works out. So like comparatively speaking, uh, in an evolutionary sense, yeah. What, uh, what 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 you tend to find is that humans share uh, muscle groups with mammals and even reptiles because we all had common ancestors. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand. Once you understand human anatomy, you can kind of translate it to creatures. Much more easier. I think, yes, exactly. So that's why I always think like even if you do want to go into creatures more than characters, f study human anatomy first. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. important. Yeah. And then once you like nailed it you can easily move on to like creatures yeah you find it much more easier absolutely um so yeah i'll be looking at human anatomy i'll be looking at lions because finding like <laughs> muscles of a dinosaur you know it's a bit tricky to uh, get something that looks correct if you find muscles of a dinosaur <laughs> please contact us <laughs> please we'd be very grateful so obviously what works really well is a lion you know they mm. have really strong back they have really strong hind legs which is quite similar to a velociraptor i would say and they got whiskers like a velociraptor like a cute velociraptor um yes as well as that i'll be looking at um scans of like what skeletons would look like and this is really important for finding your bony landmarks um again it's very important in any like creature or human yeah um design you need to understand how your skeleton works how where your bony landmarks are everything like that um, and of course, this is the concept for mm -hmm. the cold ones. This is by Reinhardt, yeah. I believe. Amazing concept artist. Check yeah. him out. Um, so yeah, so he's given them like the cool, like dark elf armor that Danny's been going through. And even um, you know, going back to talking about uh, a visual unison, you can kind of see that mm. the uh, resemblance of the uh, dark elf, uh, you know, visual keys being used here. Absolutely. And so it's a successful rendition of actually taking a. Like, the design language and iterating on it to create yeah. uh, dinosaur armor. <laughs> so like you know, the black, the gold trim, the purple. You mm. can tell it's dark elf easily. Even the horns on the uh, on the master, like yeah. swooping up like that, and you know, creating aggressive shapes. Uh, it's all very sort of dark elf in a way. Yeah, it's a good concept. Thank you, Reinhardt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you can see like um, how we designed this guy. This yeah, this dino is that he's very mean looking. He's got like really cool spikes coming out. He's got a nasty jaw. He's got a nasty jaw. A nasty little jaw. So from that, I started looking more at obviously T-Rexes and Velociraptors, mm. but crocodiles because they're green, they're nasty. The and green and the mean. mean. The green mean. <laughs> green eat, mean mean machines. Eating machines. <laughs> <laughs> so once you gather your reference, it's also super important to study it as well as much as you can. 
it's not just about like copying what you see you need to understand how it works and how it's designed mm. um so when you think of like lizards um you instantly think well for me i instantly thought like oh they're just covered in scales scales everywhere you know i think of spider-man when i think of the lizard <laughs> Well, you're very special, Danny. Thank you. Uh, so it's also talk, um, going back to talking about sort of artistic rules uh, of flow and yes. of uh, primary, secondary, tertiary forms. You can see that is actually, you know, even though this is a natural creature, uh, those rules are kind of here in a way. You can kind of use that while yeah. you're developing this, uh, these obviously, lizard main content. Yeah. Like everything has flow, everything has like topology, everything makes sense. Um, so for these guys, like, you can see they have these really cool, thick, like gnarly scales on the top, and then they eventually go really thin and spiky on mm. the tail. And I thought that was super cool. Like, oh, it's gonna look bad. Mm. And then it really softly transitions, like to the mid scales here, like these cool little circles. And again, it's not they're not splattered everywhere. They still have flow. Like I yeah. can still see the cavities. I can still see where the pattern is going. It's also balance. Mm. And. You know? I learned that all these, the way that this flows really, really helps the movement of a crocodile. So like scales and the placement of scales is really important to- M Much in the same way as armor. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It's all about movements. Um, so if you look at the legs, you can see like it's following the topology of the leg around. It's like yeah. a nice cylinder. Because it needs cylinder. to be able to bend the legs, yeah, right? Yeah, so, And it, it becomes more noisy on the hands because there's more articulation. Yeah. You need to be able to bend that more. And lizard skin, they don't stretch. They're not like humans, you know, they're just flabby. Mm. There's nothing, there's nothing there. So they have plating. to like, yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, so it's all about studying as well. Like what, what reference you get. Um, as well as that, of course, is finding reference for texturing the dinosaur. So I looked at like how the contrast works. Um, Again, talk about comparative anatomy. Yeah. Human leg, dinosaur leg. Yeah, almost, almost the same. Like the ankle, toes, knee, hip pretty much the same yeah it's just, it's just so it's so important to kind of just kind of rail that one home yeah you know? um and yeah i've noticed that mostly um it's always dark and thick on top of a of like a dino or a crocodile's body and then mm. it has, has a nice light contrast in the belly which is which is super super cool mm. and i just love Aww. these because it's it's like mummy and <laughs> but, um yeah so now i'll jump into zbrush and i'll show you the a, like a quick workflow yeah, of how cool. I created these guys. So let's slow it up. Teach me. I'll teach you. Oh, there's a <laughs> Cool. So this is the Cold One Sculpts. I could turn on the armor for now. Um, I want to turn off the dynamic solo. Uh, there. Is... there. There we go. There Perfect. Go. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, excuse me. So uh, when I first start off um, sculpting, I I put in my primary forms um, straight away. So that's all about muscles, placing them correctly, um, really nailing the silhouettes of the creature first. Mm -hmm. um, all that before, uh, of course, the silhouette. Yeah, be all of that before designing the scales and everything. Oh it's, yeah, it's so easy to just jump in and like detailing, detailing because it looks super like super super fun, but yes. you can't. Yeah, you have to just have a strong foundation. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like building a house on uh, not a foundation. <laughs> yeah, and having it collapse. What happens is like your art falls apart. <laughs> literally, it falls apart. Like yeah. you will lose your forms, you will lose the silhouette because you've gone straight into the details. So what I like to generally do is break up my creature or these dinos into different sub tools. So like the head will be separate from the body. There we go. Mm -hmm. Um, and then to make it look like it's joined, I just create like a natural seam around the edge. But it's important to, if the more um, details your creature is going to be, I find it's more important to try and keep the the body parts in separate sub tools yeah, as much as you because can. Because obviously your ZBrush will explode yeah. because uh, ZBrush eats up memory like a little goblin. <laughs> and I learned this the hard way. Um, for these guys, I wish I like kept the arms separate and the legs separate, yeah. and I wish I did the um like the top scale separate. Mm. That's all one sub tool. Um, but it looks great. I mean, all, 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 again, like you, when you're a professional, it's you're going to be living and learning, right? Mm. You're going to make mistakes and things happen. Of course. So it's just about it's learning. It's all about learning. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've even kept like the eye socket separate. I think. Yes, uh, so because like, that's again an area of noise. A lot of detail. Yeah, it's got a lot of detail in there. 
Um, yeah, so you can see that from the top view. But yeah, I looked at a crocodile. Mm. And I really try to like nail that spiky, gnarly looking scales down. Yeah. Um, and then I try to do the same thing for the thighs because I really want to exaggerate like the the yeah just the, the thickness. thickness. <laughs> I like saying that the word too much. Two C's. The thickness of Thick. these of these guys. Yes. Well, yeah, because I mean they're, they're armored units, right? They're they're mm. they're, they're, they're they're murder horses. <laughs> murder horses, and yeah, if you um, look at the face again, um, I wanted to make them more like nasty and gnarly. So mm. the best way to do that is really exaggerate the jaw um more square the more square it is the more masculine it is and just the more nasty mm. makes it look same with the muscle structure around the jaw i really emphasized it more um that's solely because uh lizards they they don't chew like humans or most mammals yeah they just chomp smash they chomp 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 yeah so like I mean, if you want to emphasize that mean like gnarly Chompiness. Chompiness. <laughs> yeah. Exaggerate that jawline they and have, the muscles. They have really strong uh, biting muscles, yes. so uh, they can essentially just like snap and uh, catch their prey. But they Can't don't have. They don't have strong. I think it's temporalis. Uh, this temporalis is your opening muscle, whereas your uh, your mass or your biting muscle. Yeah. Uh, so that's why when you, if you ever watched Steve Urban before grab a crocodile's mouth, uh, you don't need that much pressure to actually. Like, I think you can put an elastic band around it. You can just don't keep do your that. Fing- no, don't. Don't don't go <laughs> looking for crocodiles and putting elastic bands around their mouths. But you can essentially keep your finger on a crocodile. Don't do that either. <laughs> don't tell them that. <laughs> it won't open. <laughs> don't do that. It's dangerous. Uh, you can if you want. I, mean, like, I can't stop you. Um, <laughs> And yeah, again, I wanted to sell that angriness of, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. of the dino by really exaggerating the, the scales. Yeah, so like testosterone is a very... Eyebrow. The testosterone is obviously, uh, uh, what's the word, a hormone uh, mo- mo- mostly prevalent in men, right? Or, 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 yeah. or male uh, 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 creatures or people of a male persuasion. Uh, the, essentially, uh, characteristics will become exaggerated due to high levels of testosterone and they tend to be epicondyles which are mm. bony landmarks so the jaw will flare out more on a man uh, or someone with a high testosterone level in their body because there is a you know uh, that becomes exa- exaggerated because there's more testosterone mm-hmm. same with the uh, uh, the uh, what's, what's like the, the cashew nut shaped thing above the brow there's a um a, a, sh- a shift above the brow uh, that essentially becomes essentially the, the forehead becomes larger uh, because of more testosterone. The border. There's, there's a cashew there's nut a cashew on nut your head. Um, <laughs> it's yeah. not a cashew nut. It's shaped like one. <laughs> but yeah, so, yeah. So it honestly depends on what you want your character to be like. If you wanted to say, if I wanted to create like a cute lizard, I would give it like smaller scales, like cuter, rounder jawline. If I want to make it more nasty give it a big chompy face with nasty teeth and like you know it's all about character design if why don't we jump into showing them some of the sculpting yeah we've got so, about five minutes left before it's a question time so. yeah so i quickly like go through and how i sculpt my my dinos primary forms yeah primary forms are really important secondary forms and treasury forms which are mostly my wrinkles and my uh my skeletons so we look a, lot, look, look a lot like komodo dragons for this for yeah. example right for the for the thick hide yeah. on their necks we're looking at things that exist in real life to actually find reference right because like, i mean you can't find a dinosaur <laughs> as you said before and obviously yeah as i said they don't have stretchy skin it's all about hanging they'll hang so you need to really study like how cloth drops which mm. i think is like that's the best way i learned they just hang man they just hang just let them hang out so <laughs> for me when i started sculpting my scales i did everything by hand and I really prefer it over using um, alphas, just because you just get more of a control, and it just has mm. more character. I think. Again, it's just talking about you know you have you have the, you have the power to do <laughs> you have the power you can <laughs> essentially do kind of what you want in ZBrush without utilizing alphas and stuff. Obviously, yeah. they help them they help you uh, achieve as a result faster, but uh, there's nothing stopping you from just doing uh, what you need to do in yeah. ZBrush. Uh, without any like alphas or yeah custom absolutely brushes. so for my scales all i did was um when i studied like the reference of a crocodile i noticed that they all have like, they all follow topology 
So I would just like, if I put this intensity higher, I would just sketch out lines everywhere on the where I want the scales to be placed. And I would try and follow the flow of the mm. jaw. Mm. So for example, and it, can, it doesn't have to be clean. It can, it can be messy. And you should be looking at reference for this. Like fi find scales that you like, like C major or, <laughs> or, or, or G major. Which are very, musical scales. Very, very good. Um, no, look at like uh, chameleons or uh, monitor lizards or something that you want to try to use to convey the characteristics yeah. of the creature you're trying to create. Like if you want something that's more docile, perhaps a gecko would be a good one to look at. If you want something that's more aggressive, then a Komodo dragon or thick Godzilla. Yeah. Like, like um, yeah. For, for, yeah, for the face of these guys, I just looked at a, a, desert, a desert lizard. Um, they're tiny, they're cute, but they have like, like really cool spiky yeah. face. And this is this is like, this is how I would draw it out. Yeah. I would keep it messy. It's very um, organic and very messy, very yeah. loose. Yeah. Um, you don't want to plan it too much because that's when it starts looking really unnatural. Yeah. Again, like things that look too gridded and too planned uh, become, uh, they look man-made. Yeah. You you want to keep it looking organic. Avoid repetition. Yeah. Avoid things looking the same size, uh, or looking the same size and looking the same like weight, uh, because repetition implies it's man-made, mm -hmm. and you want to avoid that. So yeah, and then I'll start like drawing out where my scales be in the grids, mm -hmm. um, and you can see like I'm also drawing out like little random spots. A little baby just scale. <laughs> Just for like to help them blend in and make it look more natural, mm. um, and I always keep a morph target. This is just using a damp standard brush just to draw it out. Mm -hmm. And using a morph target, I would clean up the edges. Oopsie. Yeah. So essentially, just... you're just regaining that level of control. Yeah. What's your favorite brush? Oh, my favorite brush is the Orbs brush. Mine's is a hairbrush. A hairbrush. Oh, very good, Danny. No, actually, it's, can I change my answer? It's Guybrush from Monkey Islands. <laughs> the silence well it's only <laughs> us um yeah and then once i've uh, drawn out the scales i'll build upon it um ooh, like using um i have my own brush like a variation of a clay build up and it's just a more smoother like clay build up yeah and all i do is just really like pile it on build those forms out really really build make it. them look armored and make them look nice make some like a bit flatter give some if you study scales what they look like some have like really um there's flat but the edges will pop out it, yeah essentially there's, there's almost like they're uh, they're concave yeah um so they dip in uh as opposed to sort of becoming yeah. rounded as they pop out and some scales will have like a nice ridge on top that will pop out like this yeah and essentially it's just iterating back on this over and over again yeah, and just like is. just repeating it and just over the whole character avoiding repetition where you can yeah because it becomes unnatural looking yeah. when it's repetitive so like you can still keep the same patterns but like change the size of your scales every now and then like for yeah, example yeah, yeah. Uh, if again, I go back to this guy. Yeah, again, like, like look at that. Like you have like obviously big nice visual points because yeah. you have like these supporting ones on the edge which are becoming the frame and on the eye as well, right? Like up here. Mm. Like this big thick boy here. Uh, if you move the cursor One there. One random thick scale and yeah. the rest is just like all different sizes, all but different shapes. I think it's very, you know, it's a very successful way of actually generating um, that kind of content. Yeah, and I would do this on the whole um, dinosaur. I would draw out everything first, follow the topology. Um, the quickest way I've learned to do this now is just doing Photoshop. Yep. Just screen cap your screen and then draw it quickly in Photoshop, like where you want your scale to go. You can see even from a distance right now how Oops. good that looks, right? Like because like it just pops. Yeah, it just pops. I mean, if you zoom back out. Oopsie. Like even from the distance, it looks like scales, right? And you get if you can imagine that continuing over the crest of the mouth. Mm. That, and the reason it stands up so well is because you have a very strong construction to work from. You need a good construction. Uh, and so it's just, that's just like practicing the fundamentals, right? Practice yeah. uh, anatomy, your observation skills, your ability to sculpt effectively and efficiently uh, with using a strong mesh, uh, and just really nailing your ability to uh, develop primary forms. Yeah. 
And the reason why, oh, this is going to crash. Uh, the reason why we say avoid repetition is because you, could, you can just see like already how unnatural this is looking. Yeah, the reason we say avoid repetition is you can already see how natural that's looking. It's just very, they're all the same. It's just very, it's all the same. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> God, <laughs> Tani. <laughs> so if I wanted to break this up, for example, go on. <laughs> I would just go in with a, like a simple damp sanded brush and yeah. I would just start like making more uh, wrinkles or like more creases make them sound yeah. very thin cool and then redraw out some of, oh here we go redraw out some of the scales so that some are smaller some are a bit bigger essentially you're just breaking it up yeah yeah that's all you want just you just want to break things up um we have a few questions to go through. Yeah. Um, so we might jump to questions now. Yeah. If you're cool with that. That's cool. cool. Uh, if you have any questions, do please ask in chat uh, and we'll, we'll try and make our way through. Yeah. So first question, noise brush and zebra brush uh, used to make Chaos Warriors look worn and, men uh, and metal and such. Uh, why was it used for Chaos Warriors and not anything else? Uh, it was used for other things. Uh, Beastmen, for example, we uh, added a lot of noise. This was the, because uh, Beastmen and Chaos Warriors were made uh, in, during Warhammer uh, yeah. 1, right? Uh, and workflows change over time. Software changes. Software yeah, changes. Uh, changes. We were using different uh, soft. We were using different software packages to offer our textures at that point in time, and now we're using Substance and Quixel. Mm. So now we use that to generate high-level detailed noise because it saves us time. Yeah. It saves us time when we're texturing our characters because you you don't need to sculpt in that noise on a sculpt, right? When you can create a shader that does it for you. It, it's, it it's, it's, it's as simple as that. It saves up so much time. Uh, how long would a cloak like that take to actually uh, create? Um, not maybe like a day or two. Like you're just simulating the cloth and you're um, create. You're developing that cloth so that it's easier to sculpt on. Yeah. Uh, and then you're detailing it. So as long as you have a story in mind, as long as you have a an end result in mind, it'll only take a few days because you're just adding detail. Detailing is an actually surprisingly very fast thing to do in ZBrush if you have an artistic end game and intent. Mm. Not an end game like Thanos, like snapping his fingers. Don't. I mean, oh god, I'm disappearing. Uh, do you think of the color scheme before you start? Well, they tend to be already defined by Games Workshop in this yeah. case because obviously we have to work with the lore of Warhammer. Uh, high elves are uh, red and blue. Dark elves are like purple, purple and, and, and the purple and grey and black and yeah. gold. Uh, so, uh, you get, Skaven clans have different colors. Like Clan Mors is red, Clan Septic are green. Uh, so it really depends. Uh, for the most part, the color schemes are determined by Games Workshop. Yeah. Uh, because we're working with an IP. Uh, yeah, that's uh, essentially yeah. that one. How are the visual s themes of a faction determined? Same question. Mm. Uh, same, a same question? <laughs> same answer. They tend to be already determined by Games Workshop because yeah. this, we're working with an IP. Uh, what were your journeys into the game industry? Uh, oh. I, that's uh, Okay, so I, I went to university uh, and I studied uh, computer arts at Aberty Dundee. Uh, I'm Scottish, if you can't tell by the <laughs> accent. And I, start, I, I graduated in 2011, started working in... Uh, for a company in Edinburgh called Vimy, and I developed content for PlayStation Home for mm. three years, making t-shirts and jeans, and then I came here mm. and worked on a Room 2. Yeah. And, and you started as an intern here, right? Yeah, I... So back then, um, Creative Assembly did uh, competitions to win an internship. Um, I came third, um, and I was like, oh no, obviously I didn't get the internship. But about five months later, I got a uh, message asking if I want an interview for one. An owl flew into your window. <sighs> Literally, like a really excited, happy owl flew in and asked me. And I was like, yes, please. <laughs> I would love this interview. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I got in. And, and, uh, and now you're a lead. I'm here. And now Setting you're... you off and bossing you around. That's, right. That's what happens. <laughs> uh, what's the average turnaround for a game ready character? Uh, it can range. Uh, it could be 20 days, as fast as 20 days. could be as long as 40. Yeah. This, the whole cold one was uh, 20 days, including the armor. Yeah, that's work days. Uh, yeah. So obviously weekends or weekends. Like five, day, uh, five days in a week. Uh, a work week. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it depends. Low poly and high poly. Yeah, yeah. High poly and low poly. So like r rough, roughly like maybe 12 days for the high poly than eight for the low poly we say 10 and 10 but there's you know you can push and shove you kind of just have uh the uh you know the, the 
the ability to kind of like use the time that you have. As long as you're working well and you're working efficiently, then you know, generally speaking, like you can You'll use use the time that you have. Uh, how different are your final models from the original sketches? Uh, that depends on a number of factors. Uh, because we have so many different concept arts, it's concept arts, concept artists. Mm -hmm. Their style varies quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are a lot faster and looser. Some people are more rigid and illustrative in their approach to concepts. Yeah. So it depends. For the most part, we try our very best to stick to the concepts. But if there are um, areas that we feel that we, we can either improve the design or it doesn't work in 3D because that happens sometimes. Or like, yeah, if there's issues with like yes. skinning or yeah. rigging, then... Then we'll try and we'll say, look, we need to change this and this is why. Yeah. Uh, it's just, yeah, so it depends. Uh, for the most part, we try our best to, you know, to stick to the concepts. If you if you remember, like, do you want to bring up the, um, the just either your board or my uh, pure ref? Sure. Uh, just alt tab. Uh, that that one. Yeah, there so let's... Let's say, for example, looking at the female dreadlords, that was a concept, right? Mm -hmm. That's the final model. So I, I try my very best to stick to the, stick to the concepts when I'm working with them. Yeah. Um, and I think I did quite well with that. You did a good job. Thanks, you? pal. You're very uh, do you mainly use 3ds Max for modeling or Maya as well? Depends on the artist. Yeah. I use 3ds Max, so uh, does Jazz. Yeah, I came from Maya and I started learning Max. I came so, from yeah. Maya as well, yeah. uh, but I just prefer Max now. Uh, a few people on the team use Maya. Yeah. And that's uh, uh that's fine. Uh our, our uh, the assets for the game are authored in 3ds Max. So once you're finished developing your art, you have to then implement it into the game using 3ds yeah, Max. It's all in Max. Because uh, that's that's just what we use. Uh, that, that that means that our subversion control is a uh, uniform and it means that our shaders are set up properly for the game because they're mm -hmm. all set up the same way. Uh, that would be problematic if some people use max and maya because you know, you know yeah. You, it's, yeah it would just be an issue um i think that's it for questions for the most part yeah uh do you have any more points to make regarding your sculpts um no that that's basically everything is just yeah i just i prefer for in terms of warhammer it's more stylized slightly mm. stylized so that's why i prefer doing everything hand drawn and hand sculpted rather than alphas just because it just makes it more yeah up. Yeah, pops it more. If you want to do more realistic stuff, then go for like alphas and like really, really control them really well. But if you want to do something fun and like more stylized, a bit more expressive and yeah. stylized, yeah, yeah, it's more of a story. I feel if you yeah, it goes back to our idea of storytelling, right? Yeah, like we're actually trying to tell a story with our scalps yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to try think if I have any questions for you, Jazz. Me? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, oh. how do you feel your artistic ability has improved over the past few years <sighs> massively i don't know like i've been here for three and nearly four years now mm. i still feel like i'm just learning constantly yep. every uh, day we're, yeah that, that's like, how i feel as well yeah you're always learning right like uh, it's, it's working in games is amazing uh but it's all you're always learning because there's more tech coming out and it's always it's, al it's always improving over time yeah. so you're always learning new things uh, do we use an in-house engine? Yes, yes, we do. It's called Warscape. Uh, and we use that for developing Total War. Yeah. Uh, how, um, the, yep, see so, the um, the character art working environment is fantastic. C is, fun. Uh, C is great. Fun. Um, the character art team is very collaborative. Yeah. Uh, as you can tell. Jazz is already sick of my jokes over the stream, huh? um, and uh, there's no ends to that insight. Uh, but you know, we we're we're very proud of the work we do on Warhammer. Yeah. Uh, we're also very proud of our work-life balance here. You know, uh, we don't believe in crunch. We don't do it. No. Uh, we just get we just work for the game, and we do our best when we're here. And we'll you know we we'll help each other out as much as we can. We'll teach each other. Yeah. We'll do all sorts of like that. We yeah. just want to make the art look good yeah and we get we want to make the game look good you know yeah, it's, it's, it's a team effort uh we're, we're all we're, we're very collaborative in the way we talk to other um teams on this uh, teams on the team the way we talk to other groups uh or teams on in the in the studio mm -hmm. uh, like we'll talk to amateurs riggers designers a lot to try and obviously become uh, get to conclusions with uh, issues or challenges on the road ahead and whatnot uh and i think we did that quite successfully because we're a very collaborative team yeah yeah, it's important. Also, ice cream on Wednesdays. We get ice cream on Wednesdays. We get ice cream on Wednesdays. So it's good. We do get ice cream on Wednesdays. It's the best. 
Thank you, CA. Thank you, CA. More, more, more ice cream on Wednesdays, please. Snickers, thanks. Yeah, or Mars bars are good. Mars bars are very good. They're probably better than like any of the other ones. You're very Scottish. I am very Scottish. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any last bits of advice I can give. Uh, as an art, as artists, just keep working on your stuff. Keep doing personal art. Uh, keep learning. Um, is it th there is an issue, obviously, working in games uh, that you stagnate, and it's that's just something that happens. Mm. Uh, but tr try try to keep uh, learning and do, do, doing stuff outside of work in All order to time. yeah. But you know, if you can't do that, then just do your best while you're working. Uh, and that's it. I think I think mm. we're out of time. So thank you very much for watching for for what for, for waffling. Thank you very much for watching uh, the. Uh, the stream. Uh, so this has been brought to you by BAFTA Games Livestream and Creative Assembly. And watch this space for future Creative Assembly tutorials uh, yeah. coming up. More's so, coming. Yes. Not today, but in the future. Yeah, Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.